Hi everyone! Today I'd like to ramble about the future of 3D printed rifles for a bit. When I think about the future of printed guns, I see our ultimate goal as being to be able to build an entire arsenal from scratch using raw materials and no machining, Fallout 4 style. For this arsenal to be complete, we'd need a semi-auto pistol and 9mm, a shotgun, a semi-auto rifle, a pistol caliber carbine, 22 rifles and pistols for plinking, homemade ammo, etc. Um, in the roughly 9 years that printed guns have been around, incredible progress has been made, and some of these requirements, such as PCCs thanks to designs like the FGC9 and Mod9, 22s thanks to designs like the Maverick, G22, and Songbird, and shotguns thanks to the Liberator 12K project and Chimera, are covered quite well, but we still have some huge gaps remaining. Homemade ammo is something that's being actively worked on by a lot of people, but it's still very much in the development phase. The need for a 9mm pistol is also a big gap, and sadly one that hasn't seen much development. The gap that I see as being the largest and most vital to fill, however, is the need for a semi-auto rifle. Until this problem is solved, printed guns will always be sorely lacking in capability when compared to commercial guns. Pistol caliber carbines are a ton of fun, but they just don't have enough ballistic energy to hold a candle to an actual rifle. So, a printed rifle is something that I really want to see happen, and is what I've focused most of my development efforts on. Flywheel delay is the action type that I've spent the most time on, and while it's uh, been quite a while since my last video on the flywheel delayed rifle, it is still making progress and is a system that I have a lot of belief in. There are, however, many other ways to solve this problem, so today I want to start from first principles, listing all the possible ways to make a semi-auto rifle action, and speculate on which one of these have promise, and indulge in a bit of idle speculation about the future of printed guns. So for a breech-loading gun, the breech needs to be able to open to allow a round to be loaded into the chamber, and then close to fire. There are three primary ways in which this can be done. A bolt that moves horizontally, a breech block that either rotates or moves vertically, and a fixed breech face with a moving barrel. Let's examine the bolt category first. A gun that uses a bolt can be locked, simple blowback, delayed blowback, or retarded blowback. A locked action is by far the most common way of designing a semi-auto rifle, so let's discuss this option first. There's a multitude of different ways to lock the bolt in place, such as rotating lugs, a tilting bolt or tilting barrel, a toggle, rollers, flappers, interrupted threads, ball bearings, and even more. Um, while these systems are all different, they share a ton of very similar problems. The bolt thrust that a lock needs to be able to withstand for a rifle is anywhere between 3 and 7,000 pounds of force. Using plastic is obviously practically impossible, so the locking mechanism would need to be either entirely fabricated from scratch in steel, or made from repurposed off-the-shelf steel parts. The geometry of all these locking systems share the common problem of having very complex geometry, which would make fabricating them without machining equipment an extreme challenge in most cases. Even with ECM, it would be a Herculean effort. Two years ago, I would have called a do-it-yourself locked breach impossible, but there have been a couple of ideas that people have had and shown off that have changed my mind a bit. Interrupting the threads on a bolt and nut have been proposed a few times throughout the years as an easy way to make a do-it-yourself rotating bolt. Finding a bolt and nut with strong enough threads has proven to be surprisingly difficult, though. It probably is possible, though, especially with the right cartridge selection. I also saw a 2D rotating bolt which looked quite doable, uh, that was just cut, simply cut from steel plate. There's also a few do-it-yourself locked bolt actions that are already in existence. The Professor Parabellum pump action shotgun uses a flapper lock. The strength of that design gives me a lot of concern, but as far as I know it does work. Um, the other do-it-yourself locked breach is the Locust, made by a developer named Swarmtech, which uses a McMaster car bolt and some 2D steel parts. The Locust is just a 22, but it's possible that this design could be scaled up. I do think that a locked bolt is one of the harder ways of making a do-it-yourself rifle, if not the hardest, but it does definitely appear to be possible. Um, there's also a bunch of improvised guns, mostly 22s, that lock on the bolt handle, which should be mentioned as an exception to locked bolts being difficult. 
Locking on the handle was actually very common in the 1870s to early 1880s, when the low pressures of black powder meant there wasn't much bolt thrust to deal with. Locking on the bolt handle is very limited in terms of how much force it can take, though, so I'm only really putting it here for the sake of completeness. Now let's move on to simple blowback. Simple blowback is the most mechanically simple way to make a semi-auto firearm, and is how every printed semi-auto currently released functions. In a simple blowback gun, there's no locking mechanism. The bolt just has enough inertia that it only moves back a small amount before the bullet exits the barrel and the pressure drops. This is beautifully simple, but it does have a downside. The more momentum your projectile has, the more bolt mass you need. This leads to simple blowback typically only being used in pistol caliber guns, and as of now, printed designs have yet to go any higher than 9mm. While simple blowback is indeed very limited, there's a lot more juice left for us to squeeze without any technological advances needed, making a simple blowback 45 ACP or even 357 SIG pistol caliber carbine is probably the lowest hanging fruit in the community right now, as it's just scaling up what we have without any technological advances needed. Another thing to point out is that the bolt mass required for simple blowback is often exaggerated, leading people within the community to underestimate it a lot. People often reference a chart from a website called Orion's Hammer, which made a ton of assumptions in its calculations. The chart assumes that a 4 meter per second bolt velocity is safe, and neglects the effect of barrel length, which are both huge assumptions. It also doesn't take chamber friction or bolt twisting into account, which have pretty big real world effects on bolt velocity. I would actually be willing to wager that even low-end intermediate calibers like 44 Magnum and 30 Carbine would be totally possible with bolts as light as 4 pounds. This would result in a relatively heavy rifle um, that would probably be 10 to 12 pounds overall, but that's completely usable. So while simple blowback is definitely limited, there's a ton of cool stuff that awaits to be done with it. Now we've made it to delayed and retarded blowback. These two are usually lumped into the same category, but Soviet gun designers and the American writer George Chin tended to separate them, which I think is smart because the way they work is actually quite different. In a delayed blowback firearm, the bolt is rigidly locked by a locking mechanism until the pressure has dropped to just what's required to operate the gun. The unlocking is done by gas or recoil, but the unlocking mechanism doesn't put any energy into the bolt. The blowback portion of the operation is thus delayed. The, this action type is really rare, and the only example that I know of for sure is the Hispano Suiza HS404 20mm cannon, although I do think Browning hesitation locks might fit into this category as well. I don't think this uh, action really has any usefulness to us, so it's really just here for completeness. In a retarded blowback action, the bolt is always in motion when firing, just like a simple blowback gun, but its motion is retarded by mechanical disadvantage of some kind. Retarded blowback actions are usually referred to as delayed colloquially, and from here on out I'll go back to calling them that because that's what we're all used to. Examples include roller delay, toggle delay, radial delay, screw delay, linear cam delay, lever delay, and more. Just how potentially useful these delay mechanisms are for printed guns varies a ton. I absolutely adore roller delay, for example, but it has a really complex geometry and a need for tight tolerances. The same goes for CMMG-style radial delay. A toggle for toggle delay could be easily made with 2D steel parts cut with printed jigs, but I've always heard that toggles require tight tolerances, so this likely isn't an option either without machining equipment. A Chris Vector style system, on the other hand, that uses linear cams to accelerate an inertia block would be a very simple thing to make with 2D steel parts made with printed jigs, and wouldn't require much accuracy, so I'd consider it a pretty good candidate. It does transmit some stress to the receiver though, which may or may not wind up being a problem. Screw delay is really appealingly simple, but it would be kind of hard to fabricate and hasn't been known to be a particularly strong delay method historically. It may be a good fit for ECM though. Screw delay is really neat from a historical perspective because it's the first example of a delayed blowback rifle ever made. Ferdinand Monlicker built a screw delayed rifle all the way back in 1893, which is really cool. Now let's discuss lever delay. 
The FAMAS method of using an accelerator lever that wedges against the receiver isn't compatible with plastic receivers, obviously, but a variation where the bolt and weight are in separate tubes and the accelerator lever simply rotates about an axis pin in the receiver would likely be doable. I was actually considering a system like this before choosing flywheel delay, but ended up deciding that flywheel delay had a lot more promise. The physics of the system are identical, but flywheel delay has the advantage of being far more compact. Um, since the weight would have more travel than the bolt itself, um, it ends up taking an absurd amount of space, and it's just really hard to design a gun that where the weight doesn't get in the way of something important. So flywheel delay from a packaging perspective is far superior, while having all the same advantages. Off-axis bolt travel is a really weird method of delay that also deserves a mention. Placing the bolt at an angle relative to the bore axis splits the bolt thrust between the bore and the receiver. It's really simple, but its utility is very limited. Even with an extreme angle of 45 degrees, the bolt is still subjected to 70% of the bolt thrust. The receiver would also be subjected to 70% of the bolt thrust, which uh, is probably incompatible with plastic. There are also some really strange systems, usually referred to as being delayed, that just use raw force instead of mechanical disadvantage to slow the opening of the bolt. Annular ring delay is when annular rings are cut into the chamber of a gun to massively increase chamber friction. This is a method that some mouse guns have used to slightly decrease required slide mass. It was also used on a 30 carbine pistol called the Kimball that kind of worked. So, while it's typically considered a very weak form of delay, it does seem to do something, I think. Um, gas delay is when you use uh, force from a gas piston to delay opening. It was used on the Gustloff Volkssturmgewehr entry, a World War II last-ditch rifle chambered in 8mm Kurtz. The bolt on that gun was like 3 pounds, so raw mass was definitely doing most of the work. The Grossfuss entry, which I'm probably pronouncing that very wrong, uh, also used gas delay and managed a, a lighter bolt mass of only 2 pounds. Um, both uh, annular rings and gas pistons are very weak forms of delay, but they could maybe have very limited utility for slightly reducing the required bolt mass of an intermediate caliber gun that's mostly simple blowback, but just a little bit lighter because of these very simple and easy to make systems. So now we're done with the bolt category. Let's move on to fixed breeches. The physics of fixed breech guns makes them a really good fit for 3D printing. In a fixed breech gun, the breech is purely in compression, which printed plastic can handle quite well with the right layer orientations. With the addition of tension rods and a 2D steel breech face, a fixed breech printed gun can be made to handle just about anything. The Liberator 12K receiver is an awesome example of this, and was the first project to use this design principle. Brake actions aren't really useful at all for our purposes, for obvious reasons, but revolvers, and I'm lumping in Steyr ACR style sliding chambers here too because the physics are identical, um, could possibly be a very good option for us. You're probably thinking that the limited capacity of a revolver would be a major handicap, but there's a really cool way around this, magazine fed revolvers. I actually did some early stage work on a mag-fed revolver design a few years ago, and found that this would be far simpler to do than it first sounds. All you need is a plastic pseudo-bolt type thing that feeds around from a box mag into the cylinder which, with each cycle, and an ejector rod that ejects a spent case each cycle. Both of these components move in the same direction, and neither needs to change direction mid-stroke, so they can both simply be connected to the action bar that indexes the cylinder. One really cool benefit of revolvers and sliding chambers is that they're one of the few action types that works well with telescoped cartridges, which makes them a very good fit for DIY ammo. The use of an injector rod means that if a plastic case shatters, the fragments will be pushed out of the chamber instead of causing a jam. This is the reason why Textron used a sliding chamber for their recent NGSW bid. For a while, I was really, really excited about the idea of a magfed revolver, but I ended up shelving this project before it was finished uh, due to concerns about gap blast. 
Jeff Rodriguez has found Gat Blast to be a really big difficulty when developing his 12 gauge revolver, um, so it would likely be a problem here as well. It is possible that an intermediate cartridge like 350 Legend would have much less blast than 12 gauge, so maybe maybe this would be less of a problem, but I was hesitant to invest a lot of time in this project without knowing if it would be shootable or not. Another type of fixed breach action which I think has a ton of potential is blow forward. Blow forward is sadly very misunderstood. A lot of people have the misconception that it's just blow back and reverse. The two are very different because in a blow back action the gun is operated by bolt thrust, whereas in a blow forward gun the gun is operated by rifling friction. To think about this, try and visualize what's going on inside the chamber of a blow forward gun. Um, the pressure from the burning powder is able to push on the outside of the barrel, the base of the bullet, and the case head which pushes on the breech face. The only way that the pressure is able to push the uh, barrel forwards is through rifling friction. As a sort of thought experiment, in case you need more convincing, if blow forward was just blow back in reverse, then a stocked slam fire would send the barrel flying through the air. But in actuality, a human hand is more than able to keep it in place because it's a shotgun and doesn't have rifling friction. Um, this realization that blow forward is fundamentally different than blowback is very significant because it means that blow forward can be managed with much less mass than what blowback would re require. The HIW VSK is the only example of a blow forward rifle that I know of. It was a World War II German last-ditch rifle chambered in 8mm Kurtz. Unfortunately, almost nothing is known about it, and I was only able to find one picture of it. I think a blow-forward design has the potential to be the simplest and most expedient possible DIY rifle, and because of this, I've invested some time into some very crude test bed. They don't have a magazine or anything, and are just a uh, simple test to see if uh, one of my old 4570 barrels is heavy enough to prevent case head separation. These results were super promising, as the test beds didn't seem to have any major problems. The only big problem with Blow Forward is that it isn't really compatible with plastic magazines, because the cartridge is ripped directly upwards when feeding. This problem is easily overcome with a rotary magazine, though. Uh, rotary magazines definitely aren't very fast to reload, but they can offer pretty decent capacity. Uh, look to the uh, Johnson rifle, for example. Reverse cycle pump actions and reverse cycle bolt actions are another category of fixed breech designs that should be mentioned for the sake of completeness. For anything with rifling friction, I think it's a lot better to go with blow forward to avoid the need for an operating system, but they're awesome for shotguns. The Liberator 12K Evolver is a really cool example of this. Now let's move on to firearms with the moving breech block. Tilting blocks, rolling blocks, and trap doors all have massive stress concentrations around pins, so they're incompatible with plastic receivers. Falling blocks, on the other hand, work beautifully with printed receivers. When the block is closed, the forces are essentially identical to a fixed breech, making falling blocks one of the strongest possible action types. You're probably thinking that this is useless to us because the only falling blocks you've seen are single shots, but a semi-auto falling block is totally possible, if admittedly a bit complicated. The Spencer carbine is a historical example of a repeating falling block. Um, it looks like a tilting block, but the part of the breech travel where it actually locks is completely vertical. Um, there are a ton of examples of repeating tilting block rifles as well, the feeding mechanisms of which would be compatible with a repeating falling block also. Examples of these include the Evans carbine, the Spencer slash Bannerman shotgun, and of course the Madsen LMG and Rasmussen. I've actually built a couple of crude 4570 printed falling block test beds to prove the strength of the action, and I've had very good results. My first attempt had a completely plastic block, which was damaged by the primer, but the receiver held up great. I then made a better version with a steel plate glued to the front of the breech block, which did really, really well. Um, my attempts to make a magazine system have been a little bit less successful, though. It's definitely possible, but it's so complex that I've had quite a bit of trouble with it. My first attempt was an absolute mess. I tried imitating the Madsen system, but without a split breech face. This meant that the cartridge pusher needed to be able to switch directions and retract before the block could close. 
this thing was shaping up to be so nightmarishly complex that uh, I abandoned it before it was anywhere close to being done. I then tried imitating the Spencer shotgun system, which was simpler than the Madsen. It used a hinged extractor mounted to the action rod that doubles as a cartridge pusher. This means that the extractor needs to be able to snap over the cartridge rim after it's chambered, making the extractor super inherently weak. I actually got the CAD for this one mostly done, but I realized that there is no way this extractor would work with ECM chambers. It barely works with plastic shotgun shells and smooth commercial chambers as it is. There's no way it would work with a rough, gritty ECM chamber. I was also trying to use a screwdriver head embedded in a plastic like what the CAFE 12 uses, but I began to worry that this wouldn't hold up to semi-auto fire. I think I now know the right way forward. Imitating the Madsen system, but doing it properly with the sp split breech is probably the right way to go. Using a 2D uh, steel extractor similar to what the Madsen used originally is probably a good idea too. Um, this would not only be stronger, but also allow the use of rimless cartridges, which is really important. Um, because I, I think uh, 350 Legend and 450 Bushmaster are um, probably the most convenient straight-walled cartridges out there right now. A printed mag falling block would be complicated, but I think it has a ton of potential. I do have to admit, though, that part of this is because I just find falling blocks really cool. A small footnote that I should add about falling blocks is that verndal style actions, which I guess you could call rotating blocks, have the same strength benefits as falling blocks, as do Snyder actions. I don't think either really has an advantage over falling blocks in terms of compatibility with semi-auto, but it should be noted that um, all, all three are pretty much the same from a, from a physics and strength standpoint. So now I think we've covered all of our action options pretty extensively. Let's discuss operating really quickly. Most of the actions that we've identified as being potentially useful are either blowback, delay blowback, or blow forward, which means they operate themselves, giving them an additional advantage in terms of simplicity. A mag-fed revolver and falling block, on the other hand, would have to deal with operation. There are two main ways to operate a gun, recoil and gas. I guess you could count inertia as a third option too, but it isn't really useful to us, as it generally only works well for shotguns that have a ton of recoil. I don't see recoil operation as being a good fit for 3D printing. It would be hard to print a retainer for a reciprocating barrel that isn't either way too tight or really wiggly. You could totally do a Webley Fosbury style recoil operation where the whole receiver slides on rails, but the ergonomics of a rifle would bat like that would be so terrible as to make it completely useless. I think gas operation is definitely the way to go. Uh, it, the piston and uh, tube couldn't be plastic, obviously, but a gas tube could be made really easily from DOM tubing welded to the barrel, and steel bar stock would make a really easy piston. So let's summarize all this aimless rambling. In the near term, printed rifle designs will likely be designed around commercial ammo. I think flywheel delay is a great fit for this era, as it doesn't put a lot of stress on the receiver and is relatively simple. I plan to devote about 90% of my time, if not more, to the flywheel delayed rifle until it's finally done. Chris Vector style delay is another delay mechanism that appears to have promise as an alternative. I don't have time to work on this, but I certainly hope someone else out there does, um, because it appears to have a lot of promise due to the simplicity of the steel parts required. Blow forward is another extremely promising action, and after I get the flywheel delayed rifle working, I hope to devote most of my time and development resources into a double action only blow forward rifle chambered in 350 Legend and maybe 450 Bushmaster 2. I think this has the potential to be the simplest possible uh, printed rifle and the one that uses the least amount of steel parts. Um, this would mean some capability compromises, such as the need for a fixed rotary mag, but I think it would complement the flywheel delayed rifle really well as a simpler, cheaper, and easier alternative, although with the cost of being a little bit less capable. A simple blowback rifle is another really good design for this era, and is the lowest hanging fruit in the gun CAD community right now. Um, it would be limited to low-end intermediate cartridges like 30 carbine, of course, but that's still a huge step up above what we have released currently. I don't have the time to devote to this, of course, um, so I really hope someone out there takes this on, because I'd really love to see it. 
In a few years, I think we'll begin moving on to homemade ammo, which will likely be caseless, disintegrating cased, or telescoped in a printed case. The actions that we identified as good fits for the current epoch will suddenly become obsolete due to the fact that blowback, delayed blowback, and blow forward all require cartridges with strong case heads. So magfed revolvers, assuming gap blast can be overcome, uh, and falling blocks will suddenly become leading candidates for development. These actions are both options with conventional ammo too, of course, but the future is where they really shine. So those are my thoughts on the future of 3D printed rifles. I hope it wasn't too boring, and I hope it inspired some people to get into development. It's a ton of fun, and there's some really cool stuff out there to try that hasn't been done yet. Printed guns are sort of new frontier, which is a really rare and special thing in engineering, so it's a big opportunity right now. Stay safe, have fun, and thank you for watching.